Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of UCTV Alive for Kids. Today we are going to be joined by Shasta Henry, who is doing her PhD at UTAS, which is like a really long report that you write over many, many years. And some of you may know Shasta, she came on the show last year. Um, so she's also, uh, she calls herself Bug Girl which basically means she is an entomologist. Uh, can I throw over to you, Shasta, and can you let me know <laughs> if, if I'm saying everything correctly? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be seen by all of you again. We can't see you, but I know that you can see us. I am Shasta, the bug girl. Uh, so I study insects. I am doing my PhD at the moment on Tasmanian insects. I got some great questions from one of the schools watching about what I've been up to and I have been actually working on giving this cockroach a name. Oh wow. Previously unknown to science although known to lots of other people. Uh, so we collaborated with the Tasmanian Aboriginal Language Centre, the oh, people amazing. who are writing and recording Palo Akani. and so this is Polyzosteria yingina and yingina is a Tasmanian indigenous word for the Great Lake in the Central Highlands where this cockroach is found. Now you might be pleased to know that this is a very enlarged photo and this isn't the actual size of the cockroach. <laughs> It's oh. actually about that big. Oh, it also looks very different to most cockroaches that I've seen before. Maybe it's just because it's so big. Maybe because it's so big, but you're probably recognising, I think I taught these guys last year, uh, insects all have the same set of ingredients. Six legs, mm -hmm. uh, two eyes, mm -hmm. two antenna, and usually four wings. But you'll see this cockroach would normally have wings uh, that fold over its back and this one doesn't have any it just runs yes. around on the ground lots of insects are adapted to live in different habitats and up in the alpine where it's quite cold flight is very uh, energy intensive wow and so these ones don't bother with that they just run around on the ground in the sunshine instead that's amazing so what else are you going to talk to us about today Shasta? so today i wanted to share a few uh insect stories if we roll to the start of the powerpoint presentation Awesome. Uh, I wanted to talk about insect mainstay pollination. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also going to talk about um, how Australia got prickly pear cactus, and that story actually involves two different kinds of insects, wow. one at the start and one at the end. Uh, we're going to wrap up with talking about insect-inspired uh, technology specifically, but I'm going to be showing you how each of these subjects involves insects as technology in some way. Fantastic, and I believe that we are going to kick things off by doing a bit of an activity that yes. you can do in your classroom as well. Yes. So, um, if you're, you know, if you're at home listening in, if you're at school listening in, um, this is something where we'd, we we will get you to put your hand up. So, put your hand up if you like chocolate. I like chocolate. Yeah, yeah, I like chocolate too. Yeah, now it's my turn. So I want people to keep their hand up if they also like biting flies like mosquitoes. Oh, I wonder how many hands are up. I can't, I, there might be a few, but I doubt there would be. Mm. Um, what about, put your hand up if you like mango. Do you like mangoes? I like mangoes. Keep your hand up if you also like wasps. Oh, I wonder if there's anyone, <laughs> who knows? No one likes my topic as much as your topic, Tess. <laughs> <laughs> put your hand up if you like cheese. Keep your hand up if you like bees. And I can see as well some people are raising their hand on the yeah. Zoom chat as well. Yeah. If you do like bees, have you ever been stung by a bee? I catch insects. It's part of my job. So I've been stung by bees and ants quite a number of times. And I know that it's not very much fun. But the point is, if you like chocolate, then you need biting flies like mosquitoes. And if you like mangoes and lots and lots of other fruits then you need flying insects like wasps and if you like cheese then you absolutely need bees because all of these insects 
are pollinators. Okay. They're responsible for flying between flowers and carrying genetic material, part A, and putting it in part B, which pollinates flowers and creates the fruits and the nuts that we are uh, all love to eat and in the case of bees and milk they pollinate the alfalfa that the cows eat to make milk so that's how insects wow. are involved in creating one in three of every bite of food that you've ever eaten here's a little illustration these are the flowers on the chocolate plant and they are incredibly small and so while there's a great diversity of bees in the world, there is a lot more flies, and flies are often a lot smaller. Again, this is a very enlarged picture of the biting midge that pollinates the chocolate plant. This is what it would actually look like. And this is the mango flower. Uh, it's actually a lot of little flowers along a long stem and when these get pollinated they turn into mango fruits. And along with wasps there is a whole bunch of flies which pollinate mango flowers as well. And so even if you don't like flies, hopefully you can see that they're absolutely necessary in creating a lot of the food that we eat. They fly around just like we know bees do, they feed on the nectar in the flowers and by doing that they carry pollen on their bodies to other flowers which helps create food. Now here is a couple of bees that we we'll commonly find in Australia. In the background you can see is a normal honeybee and honeybees have been great piece of technology because they live in hives and so we're able to gather a whole bunch of bees you can even move them around in uh, America and in Australia it's common to pack up hives and drive them across the country because honeybees do such a great job of pollination we actually have to employ them like seasonal workers <laughs> to pollinate our different crops but they're not the only bees and they're not the only pollinators in Australia this smaller bee in the front of the picture is called a Banksia bee got the little yellow face mask on mm. helps me recognize it and know what its species name is and this is a native bee now they're less useful as a piece of technology because they don't live in hives, they actually live solitarily. And Australia, just like many other countries, has hundreds and hundreds of different species of native bees. Mm. Now these do play a role in our pollination. In fact, one of the things I think is the funniest is that honeybees don't like native bees, mm. but where you have a mix in a in a crop uh, the the honeybees will actually fly away to avoid where the native bees are foraging and so they actually do a better job of taking pollen to more flowers by flying around to avoid the native bees and so having a mix of both of these in our environments is actually uh, really important to improving pollination services now bees flies wasps butterflies are uh, not the only pollinators in our environments. Uh, beetles also mm. visit flowers. All of these animals are attracted by the nectar, the sweet treat that the flowers offer, along with honey eaters. But there are also flowers that only open at night and they actually get pollinated by animals like bats really? or um, the nighttime equivalent of a butterfly, a moth also have the very long, uh, it's called a horstellum, it's the tongue uh, that comes out and can go down very very long tubular flowers. Some flowers in fact evolved so specifically to be pollinated by moths that they can't be pollinated by anything else. We'll talk about that in another second. So uh, for instance in ecosystems like deserts where it's really really hot and dry the flowers would get dried out by the sun if they opened during the day so they open at night time and attract these nighttime pollinators that's amazing and like i said that's how insects are implicated are involved in producing one out of every three bites of food you've 
ever eaten. Practically every ingredient in a burrito uh, <laughs> is thanks to insects in one way or another. In this way, insects are actually providing a service, um, a technological service, you might like to think of it as, to the tune of between 200 and 500 billion dollars a year. And we haven't created any drone or any piece of machinery that could replace this 500 billion dollar service that insects are providing to humans, helping create our food, by feeding themselves. And so keeping pollinators healthy and populations uh, high in the environment is really important. That's why people are so interested and concerned about bee populations. And losing pollinators and losing species isn't impossible. In fact, it's happened. This is the Alua plant and it lives on cliffs mm. in Hawaii. It's one of those native flower species that was used to create lays, uh, flower necklaces, and so it's part of uh, the kind of cultural traditional history of Hawaii. And you can see it's got a very, very, very long flower tube and it could only be pollinated by this and this is the, called the Fabulous Green Sphinx moth. Wow. Curled up underneath its chin, you can't see it has a very, very, very long tongue, which is designed to get down the tube of the alua flowers, and it gets pollen on its face at the same time. Now, rats arrived in Hawaii, along with uh, colonising people, and the rats ate the moths, because moths are full of fat and protein and nutrients. Mm. But the alua flower plant started to go extinct because it wasn't creating seeds because it wasn't getting pollinated. And so today, the plant only persists because scientists with paintbrushes are actually taking over the role of that moth and pollinating them. So oh. I can put hands up again. Who thinks it would be a great job to live in Hawaii and to work pollinating alua plants with a paintbrush? <laughs> That is a job that somebody has to do at the moment because we lost the insect species that was evolved, co-evolved to uh, do that job. So that is how uh, insects are involved in our food production and how they function, I see, as a piece of technology providing that service to people and the cost involved in, in having to take that job mm. over if we lose those insects. So we can take some questions at this point in time, and uh, if teachers wanted, there's a uh, teachers or adults or, or students, uh, I thought of a little um, experiment that you could do when it's sunny, maybe not today, but another day, you can study how flowers attract insects by putting different pieces of coloured, maybe paper or plates, out somewhere sunny where the insects can see them, and you could count how many insects land on a bright colour versus a dull colour. Hello everyone, welcome back. There were so many questions that came through during the break. Um, we've actually got a lot to answer. Mm. So um, I'm just going to scroll up to this question about the Banksia. So in during the break, um, there are so many questions here. I'm just trying to find it. Um, uh, oh, there it is. We just went off screen. Are uh, Banksia bees a type of masked bee? Yes. From, from Logan yes. at Blackman's Bay Primary the, School. The, the yellow patch on the face, uh, Logan, is the, the mask. And so the Banksia bee isn't the only kind of masked bee. Masked bee is kind of like a, a higher level uh, description of a few bees that have uh, patches on their face and are closely related. Um, what and then else did we have? someone asked about what happens to insects during heavy rain. So on a day like today in Tasmania, when it is rainy, insects are all still out there in the environment. Uh, they often just stay in the same place that they would go to at night time when it is cold. Insects are solar powered. They rely on the sun's energy a lot for a lot of their own energy instead of uh, turning food energy into body heat like people do. So they are often just in their in their beds. Sometimes it'll okay. be under a leaf. Bumblebees will sometimes sleep inside of flowers, which wow. is 
unbelievably cute uh, and a lot of our native bees uh, dig little tunnels that they live in just like a tiny hive wow. for one a little little bachelor hive amazing uh, so they can be in little tunnels in the soil in the ground wow. or some of our bees are called reed bees and they'll actually live in hollow stems what about um, with all the rain that's been happening everywhere around Australia at the moment? Uh -huh. I've been seeing some videos of spiders climbing into people's houses um, right. because of the heavy rain to escape that. Is yeah. that something that some insects do? Yeah, I mean, we, we're familiar with insects that uh, come into our houses because we've got things like water and mm. uh, lots of tasty crumbs uh, and but also because we've got dry protected places I actually lived in a teepee in New South Wales for a while uh, and it was impossible to keep the ants from moving in under the carpet because it was a dry secure kind of um, temperature regulated space so absolutely insects are designed in a world that is just full of resources like trees and rocks and high ground and our houses yes. just look exactly the same they're they're making um, tiny little insect choices about where is a good place to be and our houses are dry and secure and sturdy wow um like we were saying before there have been so many questions that came through during the break we also had um one school scotch oakburn uh, scotch oakburn year three emailed in some questions thank you so much for sending them through um there are lots of great questions here. Um, I know that Shasta's going to talk a little bit about some of these questions later, but maybe if you uh, wanted to answer the question, Shasta, of why did you, uh, why did you, and when did you start being an entomologist? Absolutely. Well, I think some of the students will be pleased to hear that my being an entomologist and my love of insects uh, started exactly where they are now, uh, in their classrooms as young people. I was interested in uh, the animals that I could find in my backyard. I spent lots of time looking into uh, rock pools at the beach where my grandmother lived in Bridport. Uh, and so they are in exactly the same position that I was. The start of my entomological knowledge started with the things that I learned in school and the things that I looked at in my backyard. Wow. And some of the things that I still use in my science now, the things that I learned back then, how to recognize butterflies, you know, what things are pollinators. Mm. Um, so we all started in the same place. I loved insects from a really young age, which isn't to say that you then have to have a direct uh, translation. I actually worked in outdoor education for um, a few years before I even started university. That's why I was living in a tent in New <laughs> South Wales. Uh, and so I had a couple of totally different jobs before yeah. I started studying and talking about insects Diff in this way. Different, but maybe not so different. If you were living outdoors and doing outdoor education, you would have been coming across lots of insects and lots of bugs. Yes, I definitely have found links from uh, the things that I used to do to the things that I do now as well. Yeah. Um, should we answer one more question? Shasta? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so we also have a question here uh, about what would happen if all the bees in the world mm. became extinct. So that's from Amy. So what would happen if they became extinct? All the bees in the world and not just the honeybees. We would be in serious trouble uh, because, as we said, Bees are not the only pollinator. There are other insects that might rise up and take some of that responsibility. But bees are definitely some of our best pollinators uh, because they're very messy and they're very hairy. Uh, so they get lots and lots of pollen on them and they, and they have a really high pollination mm -hmm. rate mm -hmm. over things like flies. Um, ants visit flowers, but they're so clean that they don't actually do any pollination. So if all the bees in the world died, all of the hundreds of species of um, honeybee mm -hmm. and all of the native bee species in all the different countries in the world, yeah. we'd be in deep trouble. No more, no more mangoes. Wow. Uh, no, more, no more chocolate. <laughs> so what can we do to stop that from happening, Shasta? Great things that people can do at home is to plant native flowers. That mm -hmm. is a great way to support particularly 
uh, native bee species. Tasmania, our native bee species are all very small and so having native flowers which are smaller means that honeybees and bumblebees can't kind of get in and raid the larder mm. uh, and so that nectar is just reserved specifically for our um, native bee species and you get pretty flowers in your garden and you get to see all of the beautiful tiny little native bees turn up. Fantastic. So plant native flowers in your garden or in pots on your balcony. Yep. Super simple thing to do. Yep. Um, I think we're still having some sound issues and um, you might be, your mic I think is working okay though Shasta. So did you want to continue with your presentation? Absolutely. We've got other things to talk about. So uh, let's, let's rock and or roll on the PowerPoint. Show. So I was talking about uh, cactuses, cactuses being pollinated by bats and moths. And that reminded me of a, another interesting insect story. So this is the prickly pear cactus. They're native to South America. You can actually eat the fruits and this is the fruit that grows after the, uh, the flower is pollinated by a moth or a bat at night time and this is a type of insect that lives on the prickly pear cactus this is called cochineal and it is kind of like an aphid it's a specialized insect uh, you can see it also has no wings and in fact it also has no other features it's got very very small legs um, very very simplified to just do one job which is latch on like a leech to the prickly pear cactus pad and suck the juices out of the cactus uh, and they protect themselves with this powdery coating and so you can kind of see them blown up their their little the little butts poking out uh, and what they look like um, they're quite small and this is what they look like if you squash one and now I want to ask you what how you think those uh, those cochineal insects are related to the pictures that are coming up on the screen and so they're not pollinators they don't pollinate and give us chocolate and they're not sweet so they're not in candy they don't give us the milk that makes yogurt sushi <laughs> cochineal insects actually create red food coloring that's what all of these objects have in common they all have squished up and boiled and refined and dried out and ground up bug parts wow to create red food coloring so that's not blood on that finger that wasn't blood oh, i'd never even thought of that <laughs> of course pricking yourself on a cactus yeah. no it's, it wasn't blood that was a squashed cochineal insect and they have the same kind of red coloring carminic acid uh, which creates the red coloring in the fruit and so if you've ever heard these words carmine crimson lake natural red four e120 this is what the food industry means by no artificial colors that is a natural food colorant which comes from the cochineal insect wow now this is very old knowledge. This uh, has been this this insect has been used to create red food coloring and red clothing coloring in South America for thousands of years, and so this is what a cactus farm looks like, either out in a field or uh, in a kind of in a shed setup. Um, you can grow them; they're a succulent, so they're quite easy to grow, and then you sort of farm the insects that live on the cactus pads and you can harvest them for red food coloring. Now a country that has a similar uh, sort of daytime sunshine temperature to uh, South America or the, the region of South America where the cactuses are native is Australia. And so somebody brought prickly pear cactuses to Australia to attempt to establish this very lucrative red food colouring industry. Mm -hmm. 
Now, sadly, the cochineal insects didn't like it in Australia and the red food colouring industry flopped and fell over. But the cactuses did like it in Australia. And so this was a newspaper clipping uh, of diggers coming home after World War I. So this is 1919 and you can already see in this very grainy mm. photo patches of prickly pear cactus spreading across the landscape. They overtook something like 50 million hectares of uh, Queensland and New South Wales. Like I said, those cactuses are very easy to grow. Mm. One pad drops off, it will put down roots into the soil and it just spread and it got everywhere. It was very, very <laughs> intense. And if you've ever heard a person say, yep, it's totally cactus uh, to mean that something is broken down or damaged beyond repair. It's a literal translation from that whole back paddock is cactus. It's full of cactus. It can't be used anymore. That's where that phrase came from. I was excited to find out this piece of the puzzle. Totally cactus. And so how did we get from here, mm. 1919, groves of cactus uh, well we found another insect to solve the problem deploying insects like pieces of targeted technology using what could be a pest like a pesticide and so these orange and black caterpillars that you can see here these are a moth caterpillar and this species has the best name they're called cactoblastus cactorum <sighs> That is their species name. Now these are also from South America and they have co-evolved to feed specifically on cactus, um, cactus plants, cactus pads. Uh, there's a lot of cactus in South America and so an insect evolved to just feed on them. And so the cactus came out of its natural ecosystem, didn't have any of these predators and the cactus ran rampant. We did lots and lots of tests and discovered that these caterpillars, these cactoblastus caterpillars, will only eat prickly pear cactuses, which Australia doesn't have of any of natively. And mm -hmm. so these insects were imported as a kind of like targeted uh, drone technology to attack the cactus. Uh, they eat them, uh, they'll tunnel inside and out mm. and they will eat them to the extent that they actually have no infrastructure oh. left and so the cactuses collapse they aren't able to put down roots anymore and eventually all of that uh, area of New South Wales and Queensland that was covered in cactus was actually completely reclaimed. This is the Cactoblastus Moth Memorial Hall, <laughs> which I love. Uh, there is a little bronze statue to the Cactoblastus Moth up in that country as well, uh, acknowledging what an incredible piece of technology just taking this insect and its natural uh, behaviour uh, and applying it kind of like a medicine or a band-aid or a pesticide and um, and so we were able to undo the mistake that we'd made by introducing cactus by mm. introducing a cactus predator uh, but then when all the cactuses are gone the cactoblastus moths and caterpillars have nothing to feed on and so they just die out as well and you've got no more problem anymore wow that's amazing so i uh yeah i love stories like this where you've got an insect problem and then you have an insect solution as well so another uh we can take oh we won't uh do more questions until the end because i know we're having um trouble with tess's microphone but i did think another class activity you could do at home or uh, in groups in your classrooms wherever you are uh, you could think about the insects that you know of and see can you think of any other types of natural technology I heard of one on the news there's a type of bacteria that eat oil and so they send these bacteria to where oil spills have taken place to help in the cleanup a little tiny piece of targeted technology, natural technology. 
or the way that you feed your worm farm or your compost bin uh, your kitchen scraps and they through their natural um, behaviors of feeding they turn it into compost that you can then use as soil to grow more plants so those kinds of things sit down have a bit of a brainstorm and see what other kinds of natural targeted technology uh, you already know about and haven't thought about like this before now I have one more story to tell so we've talked about uh, insects as um, being used as technology how they pollinate our plants how they can be used to eradicate pests but this is some actual insects actually inspiring human made technology and dragonflies are in a lot of these stories. Dragonflies are a really remarkable insect uh, in and of themselves. For instance, they've inspired uh, drone flight technology because dragonflies can move each of their wings. They've got sets of muscles mm. that move each wing individually, which is why dragonflies can zig and zag and fly with such precision. And so when we were learning to uh, develop drones, uh, we looked at these real insect attributes and have tried to copy them into our tiniest little robots. But there was another piece of natural technology uh, in dragonflies and it's the texture of their wings. They were known for a long time to be antibacterial. But dragonfly wings never get attacked and damaged by bacteria. And it wasn't until reasonably recently that we discovered why. And it's this thing here called nanopillars. This is a very, very, very highly uh, magnified view of the surface of a dragonfly's wings. And it has these nanopillars and uh, this is on the surface of dragonfly wings and also on cicada wings. Mm. And what it apparently does, bacteria are everywhere, they, they live everywhere, they belong everywhere, uh, but to protect their wings from um, being damaged, dragonfly wings and cicada wings, um, the bacteria get on these nano pillars and as they try to move the bacteria actually get stuck and tears themselves apart and then they're not able to function and so they aren't able to do any of their nasty bacterial work on the wings of these insects. So humans have taken this as a piece of inspiration for creating technology and you can actually um, create like a man-made version of this surface and you can coat it onto things like glass, mm -hmm. onto titanium, onto aluminium and you do that. Has anybody uh, ever grown one of these kind of crystal trees? Uh, if you haven't seen one of these before, it comes as a little cardboard uh, tree and uh, you pour magic fluid into the bottom it soaks up the cardboard and that fluid is super saturated with these um, crystal forming salts and as they dry out the crystals grow out on that surface and so people are discovering how to grow these nano pillars the same way dragonfly wings have and grow them on different surfaces. Now, if you wanted to create an antibacterial surface, a structurally antibacterial, no need to spray chemicals, uh, no need to kind of um, wipe things down, what would you put it on? You could put it on the handrails at your schools, all of the doorknobs, all of the chairs, all of your pens and pencils. You could dip it into this uh, super saturated uh, liquid that would grow this imperceptible nanoparticle skin over the surface uh, and then you would have a naturally antibacterial handrails. Really interesting application I discovered is that you can grow it on uh, titanium implants. Is that under our question panel? Can they see it? Yes. yes. Excellent. 
you can see a different thing to what I can see. I just wanted to make sure that you can see what you need to see, which is, uh, this is a joint, this is a drawing of a, uh, a hip joint and they are usually bathed in um, antibacterial solution before they are put into people's bodies and even still bacteria are so strong and so good at what they do that infections can still occur and of course that's, um, that's a bad thing for the person who's getting the joint replacement but we can actually now dip these titanium joints into the solution and grow a nano pillar surface on it and therefore it has uh, less bacteria on it going into the body and is naturally protected i think that is mm. super cool it's really but cool. i made myself a personal promise that we would circle back to chocolate in the end. We started with chocolate and we're going to finish with chocolate. Shasta, how could we possibly get back to chocolate after being nanoparticle bathing salt solutions? And don't worry, I will get us there. Uh, nano pillars on dragonfly wings aren't the only kinds of nano pillars that we are aware of. There is also a thing in nature called structural colour. And Normally a, a red shirt is red because the cochineal dye is absorbing uh, all of the blue light and only sending back the red light. That is why you get these orangey, reddy colours with normal pigments. But with structural colour, if we zoom in and zoom in and zoom in on an iridescent butterfly wing, what we find down there is these uh, tiny little Christmas trees. They don't actually absorb light. What they do is bounce light. And they bounce it off in all of these different directions. Some of that light interferes with itself. And that's how uh, nature has created iridescent um, reflective colours. So now if we apply that to 3D printing, um, you can create a microstructure on the inside of a chocolate mould. Mm. I mean, you can create that microstructure on the inside of literally anything that you want, uh, but if you put it on the inside of a chocolate mould, you pour your chocolate in and you'll get a naturally iridescent coloured mm. chocolate film. So that's not a sticker. It isn't a pigment, it's not created with a chemical, it is structural colour which has been 3D printed into the chocolate mould and comes out on the surface wow. of the chocolate. So this is taking inspiration from nature, turning it into the kinds of technologies that we as human beings need. Now, the surface of a chocolate, not super important, but what is interesting, what's really valuable about this knowledge is that to create structural colour, you only need to create that specialised surface. You don't have to squish any cochineal bugs. You don't have to introduce cactus to a continent that it doesn't belong on. Uh, you don't need any waters. You don't need any chemicals. And so this is a very resource um, conservative kind of technology for us to be creating. And it's all inspired by uh, the wonders of the insect world and uh, think that is really um, special and cool. So I had another idea for you at home. I thought you could sit down and have a little brainstorm. Um, think about some of the insects that you know of or any other kind of animal or plant. Uh, and what does that plant or animal have that you want? What kind of technology as, a, um, as an awesome Iron Man kind of scientist do you want to create? I thought maybe you could make a set of robot legs that go on the outside that would give you the jumping power of a grasshopper and you will be an unstoppably good basketball player in future. Do you think that's uh, a worthy pursuit? What other kinds of insect behaviours do you want to build into a piece of technology for yourself? So that is the end of my PowerPoint presentation. We'll see maybe if we can take some questions. I think people still can't hear Tess. And I've used up all of our time anyway. I think I will harvest your questions from the notice board and uh, I will write out some answers because I think your questions are great and uh, I will send them back to the Peter Underwood Centre and people can um, see all of the answers to all of these questions um, in some different class time.
That's amazing, Shasta. Thank you so much for offering to, to do that, answer some of those questions in your own time. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in. I'm really sorry about the sound issues that we've had today. This is actually our last episode for the term. So we'll be back again in June. Uh, we've got a lot of really interesting speakers lined up. Uh, we'll email out some more information uh, to everybody who's on our mailing list. But thank you so much, Shasta.